Hi, this is your host, Sabdil Bhartia, and we are here at Open Source Summit in Seattle. And today we have with us Lehman Baird, co-founder of Herera. Lehman, it's great to have you on the show. Oh, it's great to be here with you. Since you know you're co-founder of the company, so I would like to also quickly talk a bit about, of course, we have covered, you know, uh, Herera before. We interviewed Andrew there, so our audience, they do know, but it's always good to refresh their memories. So first of all, let's talk about what is Herera all about? What problem that you saw in the space that you felt you needed to create this? Yeah, so Hedera is a DLT, you could call it a blockchain, but it is well governed, very fast, very secure, with uh, predictable low prices. And so these are, these are things that we saw a real need for. Uh, there's no blockchain out there that has this kind of truly decentralized governance where you have a lot of different people that you know who they are, they have a reputation to protect and they're trying to protect it that are doing it as opposed to just a few people that you don't really know who they are. It has extremely low prices. You can transfer a token to someone, a million dollar token for a tenth of a cent. And I didn't say number of H bars, I said a tenth of a cent because it's denominated in dollars. And so as the price of H bar goes up and down, your costs are predictable. And so people really like that. And it's asynchronous Byzantine fault tolerant. That's an extra high level of security. Uh, no other major ledger is doing that. Uh, and so there's a number of things that we, we really saw as a problem back in 2017 when we started Hedera. In today's world, what is the scope of distributed ledgers blockchain? Yes, what is the scope of the people using it for? This is, this is exciting because back in 2017, 2018, uh, only a few people were using it, just cutting edge people. And people built tokens that were just, I'll draw a picture and make a token out of my picture. Today is very different. We have people really using blockchains now for real purposes. They're taking real world assets and turning them into tokens. They're recording information of carbon footprints and carbon credits and these sorts of things for real. And that's making a difference to their bottom line. It's allowing them to do things they couldn't do before. Now we are seeing the real world using these ledgers for real purposes. That's what we're seeing now. And can you also talk about some new technological trends? We talk about Web3, we talk about Gen AI, we talk about edge computing, where you feel that distributed ledger blockchain play a very, you can say, fundamental, pivotal role. Yes. So for example, you talked about generative AI. Okay, this has great promise, but also great threat. There is, a, it's a good and bad thing. You have the question, did I really, um, did I really, the picture that I'm looking at, was it really taken by a human being or is it just generated by some AI? So you need signatures, but then you need to know identities. Ledgers are useful for this. Identity, self-sovereign identity, really needs ways of revoking it when it's no longer valid and you need a ledger for that so that you have this revocation thing. So proving it with signatures does that. Or you can record the provenance of the training data. So Equity Labs has built on Hedera to do this very thing. And so what they do is they say, well, I have this AI, what data was it trained on? Was that good data? Was it malicious data? Was it biased data? Big deal. Are we having bias in our AIs? I want to see the data and I want proof that it was trained from that data. And it may be that the model came from a set of data and then they used that model and trained it on a second set of data. So I need a whole tree of the history of this, of its provenance. And so they're doing that on Hedera. This is important. And so AI has great promise, also great threat. And people are seeing that ledgers are the key to that and they're building on Hedera to do it. So we can paraphrase what they used to say in Spider-Man movies with great power, concrete threats. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, um, can you also talk about the impact on Web3? Because we do talk about Web3 a lot. Absolutely. So Web3 has this great promise of its own. Uh, but you, if you really want to be using it seriously, you need to be able to do lots of transactions. Right now, more transactions are done on Hedera every second than anyone else in the world. We're well, well over a thousand transactions per second. And they're doing this to record real world things. These aren't internal transactions for consensus. These are real world transactions. So Avery Dennison has the Atma project. They track billions of objects in the real world and they're bringing them to Web3. But they had to wait until it was fast enough that they could be doing more than a thousand per second and not breaking the bank. They had to be able to afford it. So it's a tenth of a cent in US dollars and they need it to be predictable. It's a tenth of a cent in US dollars for each transaction. And as the price of H bar goes up and down, the price of that transaction stays right at a tenth of a cent. And so they're doing over a thousand a second right now on Hedera because they need to have the trust the public view of what's going on, 
but they also needed to be predictable pricing. They need to be able to handle the transaction flow of over a thousand a second. This is what they were waiting for. And so Web3 is really unlocked when you have the ability to do those sorts of things. The company was started way back in 2017, right? Can you also talk about the origins or relationship with open source, importance of open source for Herrera and for you? Yes, I think open source is incredibly important. So everything that we do is open source. We have the, the main net itself is open source software. Anyone could download it and, and run a main net. We also have mirror nodes that allow us, and block explorers, chain explorers. We have those as well, all open source. And then we have accelerators that are built on top of it. And so we've built accelerators for making a DAO, to make it very easy to stand up a new decentralized autonomous organization. Hash.io DAO now is one that makes that easy. And there's one for um, stable tokens, stable coins. Stablecoin Studio makes it easy to do that. And then we have this enormous ecosystem of people building open source on top of us. And so I think this is very important. And I love that we're at this open source uh, conference right now. But it's incredibly important that people be able to build open source projects on top of it. And of course, people can build proprietary subject, um, projects too. You can build a proprietary project on top of our open source foundation. But then people also build open source projects on our open source foundation, and the foundation is open source. In the last couple of years, we have seen some disturbing trends, you know, where organizations will change, companies will change their licenses to leave the you know, community eye and dry. Uh, I, I don't want to go into the details, but what I do want to ask you is that, do you see that this is something normal we have been seeing since early days of open source, or this is something that you ma makes you worried? The reason I'm asking this question is because we are here at the Open Source Summit. So I am very worried when something is only pretend so open source, or it starts off open source and then it becomes pretend open source. Okay, everything we've done is Apache 2. We are committed to staying Apache 2. That is a real open source. There are many open source licenses, but it's a real open source license. It's a Libre one. Um, we are very committed to that. And a lot of people are building on us. And, uh, and they're building, you know, some of them open source things. I can't say whether they're going to turn to the dark side or not. I hope not. But we're also building our own tools that are open source that will not turn to the dark side. And this is important. Any open source community needs to, to really believe that it's going to stay open source in a real sense for the future. But as the market changes evolve, you know, sometimes a lot of companies, they point towards the cloud vendors. And, but the, the, the thing is that market will change. The market will evolve, you know. So just because market has changed doesn't mean we will give up on the values that we started. So when you see the market is changing, how do you see open, because you run a company which has roots in open source, how, how, do, how do you change with the times? So, you know, it's funny. The best way that we ensure that it stays open source as the times change is that it's not run by a company. Hedera, the ledger, the blockchain, is not run by a company. It's run by 32 different companies and they all have to vote. And if they wanted to make it not open source, they would all have to agree on that. And then nobody would use it and it would die. So this is actually really important. There is a company called Hedera, but its whole job is to put on conferences for the 32 people that actually run, or 32 companies that actually run Hedera. And, so, and they're big names. You've heard of them. It's Google and IBM and LG Electronics, and it's the biggest bank in Africa, Standard Bank, and it's the, one of the oldest financial institutions, or the oldest financial institution, I think, in South Korea, uh, Shinhan Bank, and it's, it's the biggest telecom in Europe. It's all of these really big players. So there is not a company running this blockchain. That would be a disaster. And so it's not just open source in the sense of the software is free. It is also reflecting that in its governance. There is no one party. And there are other systems that say, you talked about how things change over time. Hey, we'll let everyone govern. Everybody can be part of the governance. But you know what happens over time? It narrows down to you know, five people or the real people doing the governance of the code base. We have ensured that won't happen because it is, it is set up from the beginning to be decentralized among 32, and we're hoping to grow to 39 organizations. And it's written into the bylaws that it can never shrink. It has to be those 39. And so, I mean, I guess it could shrink, but it, it won't because of the way it's been set up. And so um, this is important because things can change over time. You can start with everybody's involved and eventually just a handful are involved. And that's what you have to fight against from the beginning. Do you feel that moving your code base in a neutral, it could be Linux Foundation, it could be a neutral body, which is once again not controlled by one or two companies, is the right approach for future of open source? I think it is so important that it not be one entity, that it be multiple entities. That's why we have 32 entities. 
This is important. It needs to be multiple entities that are jointly controlling it because if it's one entity, then you could, as you said, they could do something malicious. It, that it's all about collaboration among a bigger group. And that's why we have 32, actually it'll be growing to 39, uh, but we don't have one. And I think that's important. It really is. When it comes to things like Web3, we always hear that, hey, you know, oh, it's another buzzword, it's another hype, you know, we have seen so much, you know, NFTs and all those things. Realistically, can you talk about, when we do talk about Web3, how it's different from this world? And what are the real life problems it will actually solve versus, hey, you know what, it's Web3. Exactly. So of course there's the hype cycle and we started with all the silliness and so you, you tokenize a picture and you have DeFi that's really fake DeFi. I'm just giving you coins, you give people coins, you give people coins that aren't even real coins. All of that it happened and you know, okay, that's how anything starts. What we're seeing now though, is that it's affecting the real world. People are doing real carbon credit tracking and trading in ways that would be difficult without the Web3, without using building on Hedera. They're doing tracking of real world um, objects to get their, their carbon footprints. They're doing real world token asset, uh, asset tokenization of houses and gold and silver that allow them to do things you couldn't do in the older way of doing things. I talked to someone who tokenized their house and they're able to do new things you couldn't do before. You can take the tokens of your house, break it into pieces, sell them to people, and they get a fraction of your rent every month. It's not a REIT, it's not a landowner or a, a landlord, it's a new model and it's enabled by the Web3 stuff. So yes, lots of silliness for a long time, but the silliness now is turning into real world things that are changing the real world in very interesting ways. And what kind of technologies, uh, of course, distributed ledgers can be one, uh, LLMs can be, which are going to be foundational for Web3 experience. Sure, so LLMs may give you a good help page and that sort of thing. Uh, I think that these are important, the, just the, the basic uh, ledgers. We have to fold it into things that people are already using. So we have banks and credit unions right now that are taking their banking software and building in crypto wallets that can do Hedera. This, you, so if someone already has the banking software used to go to your bank or your credit union, you fold in this new thing. We have people that have games, that have in-game assets. But now they're folding in tokenization so that your asset can go with you to other games and you own your asset and the, the company that, that is running the game can't nerf your stuff and take it away from you. Um, we're seeing in places where people are already doing something, they're now starting to build in the Web3 stuff. That's the way you do it. You make it invisible, you make it easy, you build into things they're already doing. Can you also talk about, earlier you did give some examples, but uh, you can name the companies or use cases that are leveraging Hedera and where you see uh, there will be a lot of scope in Web3 space as well. Absolutely. So all the stuff I've been talking about, Aberdeen is doing real world token as uh, asset tokenization on Hedera. You have Avery Dennison that tracks billions of objects. They're doing over a thousand transactions right now on Hedera. You have Equity Lab that I talked about. Uh, there was one scope that uh, does signatures and documents and keeping track of them. And the Starlink project did the same thing with um, recordings of, of even Holocaust survivors and people and making sure that they'll be preserved forever by putting hashes of them on the, on the blockchain, on the ledger. And so we're seeing people doing all sorts of things. Mendeley's, a name maybe you don't even know, but they're brands you know, Oreo cookies and Toblerone chocolate and Ritz crackers. They are now using Hedera. They just joined the council even, but they're using Hedera for consumer customer engagement. And so customers can have loyalty rewards and they can buy things with it. And, and um, they are making possible things that weren't possible before because of the Web3, because we lower the price of doing transactions and the speed of doing the transactions and it makes it possible to do things you couldn't do before. What kind of things we should expect from Hedera this year? Just give us a glimpse. Ah, uh, so you're gonna see lots of features implemented that came from the community. You talked about community. We have the HIP process, Hedera improvement process. The community has all these things they want, they're coming in and they're becoming part of, of the mainnet and on the mirror nodes and other the, the things around us, but in the core as well. We're gonna be seeing that this year. We're gonna be seeing state proofs that allow you to ask it, hey, what's my balance? And it can cryptographically prove to you what your balance is. You don't have to take the word for it of whatever computer you're talking to. Uh, we're gonna see lots of stuff this year. More council members, I imagine. Um, we're gonna see a lot. Iman, thank you so much for taking time out today. Talk about Hedera, talk about, I, I really love the way you approach open source, uh, the way it should be 
not owned by one, but many. Thanks for all those great insights. And I would love to chat with you again soon. Thank you. Well, thank you. It's been great talking with you. Thanks.